Well, this this is one of the dilemmas in studying human biology is how does, you know, how does this cell here know to be an eyeball and this cell here know to be an elbow? They all have the same DNA, you know, 26 chromosomes or, and, and all, but something happens differently here than there. And th there are many theories about it, but the one that makes the, sense, the most sense to me is that there's something... They're, they're following the directions of a template that I think is electromagnetic in nature and does precede the body. So I think, you know, this gets into all sorts of metaphysical and spiritual questions too. Um, when we're born, I think we are more than just the physical body. And um, I think that from the embryo on up, development is following um, an invisible guideline. Uh, my full belief is that humans have a, we have a, you know, physical body, we have energy body, we have emotions and thoughts, but we also have something higher, whether it's the higher power or soul or self that is not physical, but it uses the physical body to have a full life experience. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Bernard Beitman. Yeah, you know I study synchronicity, meaningful coincidence, serendipity, but I like to say it, so that's what I'm doing. And today we're going to uh, get into biofields, the energy around you and that permeates you, your electromagnetic field, some might call it your aura, and we're going to look at how that's connected to um, synchronicity and probably get to the mind of Earth, uh, of Gaia, our consciousness. And one of the parts of this is to have our guest today, Rick Lex Leskowitz, uh, tell us a synchronicity story and be able to connect that to uh, biofields. Uh, the story, as I summarize it, using artificial intelligence to sharpen um, the details of the coincidence aspects, uh, it drops out it, emotion, but it gets to the core, like the skeleton of the coincidence, which a coincidence is two incidents coming together in a surprising, unexpected way that has meaning to the person experiencing it. In this case, uh, uh, Rick needed a couch. Uh, by buying a couch, he met the guy who brought the couch to the place he bought it, who was a film producer who needed an on-set advisor for the movie he was doing that happened to be near where Rick lived in Massachusetts. That's the quick summary. Rick will tell us the story in more detail. Uh, Rick Leskowitz uh, was a consultant psychiatrist for over 25 years with pain management program at Spalding Rehabilitation in uh, Massachusetts. And part of what he was doing uh, was um, in being involved with pain management at and where he founded uh, the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Boston, where uh, he founded the Integrative Medicine Task Force there, Integrative Medicine. Uh, he holds an appointment at Harvard Medical School, has studied energy, healing, meditation, and hypnosis for over 40 years, and has more than 50 articles published in leading scientific journals. He's also edited three, edited three textbooks, and his documentary film about group energies and sports, The Joy of Socks. It's about the Red Sox. He, he lives in boston he's a, he's a red sox fan weird science and the power of intention this movie was broadcast on pbs so he's been out there um his recent book uh his, his latest latest book uh well, that's how i got in touch with him um is the mystery of life energy and we're going to be talking about the mystery of life energy and probably energy healing but let's welcome rick to our show and uh Let's uh, tell us maybe one of your coincidence stories, Rick. Well, first of all, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and to come at it from a, a different angle. It's an unusual angle. Um, you know, I've had 
coincidences in my life. I've been interested in, you know, reading about Jung and synchronicities, but I was really amazed and pleased to find that somebody such as yourself has made it the focus of study. So uh, would you like me to fill in some of the, the background on the couch story? Yeah, fill, fill it in. But first, what do you think of the skeleton that I produced about your well, story? That was the event that happened. But as you said, <clears throat> AI drops out the emotion. And I think that's where the energy part really plays an important role. So, Oh, it does. It does play a part. And the, the funny thing is, and I didn't do it, uh, is that the AI can pick out the emotion, too. Uh, oh. And for, for a pretty skeptical guy, uh, a colleague of mine in the Coincidence Project, the AI came up with a pretty good read on the his emotion in a fairly complicated coincidence. So I could have gotten that out, but I wanted to begin by showing you and the others that you can get to the anatomy of what we're talking about and then put the flesh and bones, which is uh, the flesh on it, so that uh, you have the emotion with it. But first, what was the thing itself? That's what I did. And I'm glad it worked out, sounded pretty good to you. So why don't you tell us the whole story? Well, the story is that um, we had a couch, uh, living room couch. My wife and I live in Western Massachusetts. We had a living room couch that was showing its age. And uh, every time I was in a Zoom call, people would say, what's all that stain behind you? You know, so I got a little grief about it. So we took the plunge and ordered a new couch from the warehouse down the road. But unfortunately, there were supply chain issues and they said it would take six months to deliver it. So we figured we could we could live with it for another six months. So six months later, they came with the new couch and loaded it up, took out the old one and loaded up the new one. And only then did we realize they had ordered the wrong size couch. It was two seats instead of three. So we had to go through the same process again, and it was another six months before the, the correct couch got delivered, almost a year to the day from the time we ordered it. The uh, delivery guy, you know, took out the old one, put in the new one. But then he began to chat with my wife because my wife is British, and he heard her British accent. He said, oh, you're you're British. And he said, I went to school in, in London. And I said, oh, you know, where'd you go? And he said, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, which was like you know, the Juilliard or something. It's like the creme de la creme of uh, arts training there. And it's not the kind of thing that uh, furniture delivery guys usually have in their CV. So so I kind of said, oh, what did you study? And he, he talked about it. And it turned out he has moved from uh, uh, theater to movies. And he's been producing movies um, recently. He happened to be in Western Massachusetts. He's based in Canada, but he happened to be in Western Massachusetts for the summer helping his sister run her furniture shop, that was the connection, while he was scouting out locations for his new film. And I said, oh, what's your new film going to be about? And he said, well, I'm going to be, it's going to be about a, a veteran coming back from Vietnam suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I said, oh, I used to work in the VA and treated Vietnam veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. And he said, yeah, we're going to um, you focus on some of these newer techniques like tapping and he demonstrated you know the ef energy psychology thing and he said oh that's what i have done for many years in my clinical work and both of us were like ah <laughs> because it was such an unusual thing so he said would you be willing and able to help advise us in the film because we're starting shooting and, and it was a couple of months before they started shooting so it was just you know 20 minutes down the road so i went on on site and was on the film set um helping them make it more realistic. Um, they were, he was actually using the tapping and the EMDR um, uh, to, to help the veteran in the, in the movie. He was, the, he played the veteran actually, but they had a sort of, I guess you would say a Hollywood kind of version of how the flashing lights and all. So I, I toned it down to be more realistic, but basically he was, he was very attuned to this whole thing. I got, I got to um, work with the, the, the woman who played the therapist is actually a pretty well-known actress, um, Virginia Madsen, who was in, uh, she won a, a Academy Award nomination for her role in Sideways, if I may, you know, do some name dropping here. But, and, you know, so the people on the set were very interested in it. They 
they liked the idea of using it as a as a group thing. We didn't actually set up formal group training, but it's now it's now in post production and it should be out in the next uh, season festival season. And it's a great way to put some of these new biofield healing ideas out there into the mainstream. It's a uh, so you know the coincidence of that the the correct couch wasn't delivered on time. If it had been, none of this would have happened um, because he wasn't doing the project yet. So as it was unfolding, I had that just sense of, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, you know, something that something bigger was was going on. I didn't measure my biofield during the process, but I'm sure I'm sure it expanded. And my sense on it is that there's a sort of choreography that goes on in events like this. And sometimes it makes sense to me to think about it in terms of like guidance from, you know, higher parts of ourselves or even spirit guides or whatever. But there has to be an energetic attunement for it to happen. If he and I were on very different wavelengths, you know, he would have just come in, dropped off the couch and said thanks and goodbye and wouldn't have even started to, to chat. But something helped him feel comfortable and helped me feel comfortable. And there was some sort of energetic alignment. You know, it would have been interesting to do some of the some of the measurements that we did in the the sports documentary where you can for example, measure um, a heart rate pattern that's called heart coherence that comes about when when people are in alignment. It would have been, we, you know, we weren't set up for an experiment to, you know, measure our heart rate and, and monitor it. But that would be my guess is that we were in some sort of energetic, psychophysiologic alignment or resonant, resonance when that happened. And because we both had the openness to it and the ability to line up, it did. It did happen. A, a lot of coincidences, sort of, are, are near misses. And you know, afterwards, you say, "Well, if only I had said this, that would have happened." And I'm sure you come across that in your work. But th this was one where it really clicked, and I think it was because of an energetic alignment. Definitely, um, there was also a. It was an energetic alignment. Somehow, you were able to be comfortable with each other. Exactly. And I don't know how you separate that from the the uh, the English accent hook that that your wife had an English accent, and that seemed to trigger the conversation in the direction that you ended up going. Right, but you know that meant that he felt comfortable enough to ask a personal question about a customer. That you know, I don't know, I don't know what his guidelines are about you know just in and out and thank you ma'am um but you know he he was personable and maybe he's like that all the time i mean he actually turned out to be a very personable guy so it's not that unusual that he would have a, a nice conversation with the customer but yeah that was just such a an interesting angle to have it build up up off of well that was the the hook that he then could uh, catch himself on with you or pull the two of you together and uh, recognizing the accent but that wasn't enough I mean that, that all the rest of it that you told about the movie that he was a producer just doing something for his sister is like uh, it's that that all is a uh, major coincidence happening um, but it's the the biofield feeling comfortable with each other and resonating with each other. Uh, please describe what you mean by that, because it's so important for, I think, our audience to be able to recognize that we can feel the biofields of other people. Yeah, I mean, that's a, I think it's the key question in all of this, because just to go back a little bit, um, well, you, you went to medical school, too, and in medicine, you think of the human being as a machine and you just break it down into the parts and then you find the part that's broken, you replace it and you put it back together, whether it's on the organ level or the cellular level, it's very mechanical and there's nothing that really unifies and harmonizes the whole process. Every other healing tradition in the world talks about an invisible healing energy, whether it's you know, in the yoga tradition, they talk about prana, in traditional Chinese medicine, they talk about qi, but we don't have that in, in Western medicine until recently. And now that sort of the East and West have been meeting over the last 20, 30, 40 years, there's more awareness that something is happening 
And the term biofield is what's been developed to encompass it. You know, we have idioms to talk about that, you know, you talk about somebody's aura or, wow, he was really glowing after that performance or something like that. So we, we, we know, we acknowledge it. We just don't, haven't looked at it scientifically. And so there's a lot of good evidence that, um, and it's not surprising that there is a magnetic field around the body, for example. You know, the heart has a lot of electrical signaling. The brain has a lot of electrical signaling. And when electricity moves, it by the laws of physics, it generates a magnetic field. So there is one. It, it happened, the heart field happens to be the strongest of any part of the body. But that can be measured with usual, with standard Gauss meters and things like that. And it can also be detected by us. We all know the sense of personal space, for example, that we're comfortable with a certain distance between people. If somebody intrudes on our personal space, as the saying goes, we feel it. So part of it is you're looking at the person and you're cognitively aware that this person is too close. But we've all had the sensation of, you know, somebody coming up from behind us. And is that is that a coincidence that we turn around when they're when they're there? Um, or is there some energy sensing thing going on? So a lot of these um, biofield healing methods involve learning how to sense energy. That um, the simplest form is it actually viewers can see just with your hands, you start, you know, a couple of feet apart, palms facing each other, bring them closer and further without touching. And actually it helps if you close your eyes, but at some distance apart, usually, you know, six inches a foot, you begin to feel something. And it's really important to do this and convince yourself that it's not just the 98.6 temperature type of thing, that there's some kind of pressure or tingling that people believe, I believe, is the boundaries of the biofield on this hand meeting, bumping up against the biofield from this hand to the degree that you can feel it. So people can feel energy interactions. Um, it's the basis of many of these uh, energy healing techniques, everything from therapeutic touch and Reiki to healing touch. And, you know, there's, there's, there's many of them now, but that's, that's the common denominator. And so the idea is, well, th this is another important question. Is the biofield just sort of an emanation of the body, much like a light bulb emits light? Or is it something more uh, primary prior to the body? And th this is more, even more challenging, I would say. But I got into that question because in my pain management work, I uh, had an opportunity to work with some people with phantom limb pain, which is the pain that persists after a part of the body is amputated. Uh, many, it's common after an amputation for the people to feel like the limb is still there, but it's not painful. But a, a, a significant number do have very difficult to manage pain. So there's one particular guy in our program was not doing well with uh, biofeedback and meditation and aerobic conditioning and things like that. So I said, do you want to try something now for something completely different? <laughs> um, so for you Monty Python fans. So he he actually lay down on the couch, on the, not the couch. <laughs> Got me thinking about couches now. No, he lay down on the examining table. And I said, just, you just relax, you close your eyes, relax. I'm going to smooth out your energy. I said, use some generic phrase like that. And I did basically the same thing, starting from his head, working my way down just to, to feel that same pressure energy, just to begin to smooth it out. But the interesting thing was when, when I got to his missing leg, I could feel that same pressure sensation, even though there was no leg there. And he opened his eyes and said, what are you doing, doc? Because he could feel me touching his phantom leg. And, you know, there are no nerves down there. There's no way he should have felt me. There's no way I should have felt him. So that really crystallized for me the idea that the biofield is a real thing. It's not some, you know, what the neuroscience version of phantom pain is it's uh, maladaptive, rewiring well you know it's that it's a it's a figment of the brain creating it i and many others obviously came to believe that that biofield is something real and tangible and out there um working with it you can we developed a protocol for healing phantom pain by dealing with the emotional trauma of amputation that's you know surgeons don't <laughs> deal with emotional trauma but if you can find an there's an energetic technique 
called tapping EFT, you know, which patients balance out their own acupuncture points and meridians while they're reviewing unpleasant events. And, you know, that it leads to this a very common sensation of, and that helps to rebalance the biofield. So phantom limb can be treated with that modality, but it raised the question of what's actually out there. Is there a way of taking a picture of the phantom limb? And kind of surprisingly, as of now, there really isn't a reliable way of, of taking that image. There, there have been some studies dating back 40 years ago with um, Curlian photography for smaller objects that are thin and can fit between the, the plates in the, in the unit that they did a, they cut the tip off of a, um, a leaf. Well, first they did a, a curling photograph of a leaf and it shows the corona around the, the edges of the leaf, the electrical field around it. But then they cut the tip off to see whether the, the corona receded to just follow the, the border of the leaf or what happened. And what they found was, was actually, this is the cover of a book that, that highlights it, that shows you that the corona is still there, even though that part of the leaf has been amputated, if you will. So it's an exact analog to the phantom limb with showing the biofield there. So what this says to me is that the biofield is, is actually primary and somehow or other the leaf or the arm or the physical body organizes around that magnetic field. It's the, the, the analogy that really helped me kind of come to it was um, with, with bar magnets, you put a bar magnet under a piece of paper and then sprinkle iron filings over it. And the iron filings line up in this beautiful geometric symmetrical pattern um, that you can't see with your naked eye. You can't see the lines of force, but the filings line up with it. And I think in the exact same way, the cells of our body are like iron filings and they line up in accordance with the invisible energy field of, you know, the acupuncture meridians, the chakras, the biofield. So the biofield comes first and the physical body crystallizes or condenses around that template. So I think that's, that's I hope someday soon that a, 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 a Curlian image can be taken of a phantom limb. There's sort of, I don't, we don't quite, I'm working with a group of people on this, we don't quite understand why it hasn't clicked yet, but we haven't been able to replicate those original findings. But I think that will be a key in establishing biofield science. That, that the profound influence on you of the guy who, some, whose phantom limb you could feel, that's, 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 that's what does it to us, experiences like that say hey there's something here he can feel it and you yeah. knew that he could feel it and you could feel something yourself so that's an experiential record in your mind of yes it's real and when you say the biofield um is primary um what do you mean i mean uh, like uh, when when we're born, we're born with a biofield, but where's where what how is the biofield first uh, before the fetus? Well, this this is one of the dilemmas in studying human biology is how does you know how does this cell here know to be an eyeball and this cell here know to be an elbow? They all have the same DNA, you know, twenty six chromosomes or and and all, but something happens differently here than there, and there are many theories about it, but the one that makes the, sense, the most sense to me is that there's something, they're, they're following the directions of a template that I think is electromagnetic in nature and does precede the body. So I think, you know, this gets into all sorts of metaphysical and spiritual questions too. Um, when we're born, I think we are more than just the physical body. And um, I think that from the embryo on up development, is following um, an invisible guideline. My full belief is that humans have a, we have a, you know, physical body, we have energy body, we have emotions and thoughts, but we also have something higher, whether it's the higher power or soul or self that is not physical, but it uses the physical body to have a full life experience. And I think that's where the, the energy template comes from, from those higher levels. And the body 
it, it's like all right it's like um another good analogy is h2o what is h2o you ask anybody and they'll say water and that's correct at room temperature if the temperature is 20 below zero h2o is ice and if the temperature is you know 250 degrees it's steam so the same substance can exist in very different forms depending on its energy state so i think consciousness can 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 start as spirit and gradually condense down into thoughts emotions energy and finally physical stuff we're just so focused on the physical that you know we we can't see yet beyond these other levels but i think that's something along those lines is how they all our multiple dimensions interact well you, you said a, f a few things but what i take away first is the phantom limb that you could feel and second that there's a bunch of cells dividing uh, to make a human being but they they line up in the right place to do the things that that right place needs them to do and that's been a mystery that i had forgotten about uh, about how that happens and your description of that is a nice clean visual a video i can see of uh, there's a map there's a template three-dimensional for the dividing cells and then line themselves up uh now that's a in a kind of simple way a coincidence that you can have the cell the cells line up in the right place they it's a little bit like you and the couch being in the right place at the right time to get into the movies uh mm -hmm. there there could be a way of thinking a way of thinking about uh coincidences uh as a template uh that then somehow you fit into um i'm i i'll have to mull that one about how it works on the cellular level because i i really think it's i mean the the way modern uh, research is trying to explain cell differentiation they're doing measurements of the electrical and magnetic properties of cells and they find that it's different here than there in one part of the body to the other but where those differences come from they they say it's self-organizing principle that somehow the cell knows how to do it which i i think that just you know passing the buck or kicking the can down down the road whatever you want to call it that I think there's a higher level involved. And I think that's the template. And and I, and, you know, now that you talk in those terms, I think that's also where coincidence has come from, that higher level template that sometimes it crystallizes out into a life event. Sometimes there are near misses and, and um, you know, life proceeds accordingly. <laughs> well, some, sometimes the babies don't come out right either. Uh, there's a there's a miss something or other so that there's a miss coincidence but if i continue the way you're thinking of template for the embryo to follow it's a big fairly big jump but not an impossible one to say that you are a guy who loves movies I mean, you already did one yourself, got on PBS. Uh, you're a guy that has been working with veterans. Um, you're the person that they needed as a consultant on that movie. I know. It was, it was like weird. If you, if you, I was like the ideal person in Massachusetts to do it. And here, here we came together through a... And they were doing the movie in Massachusetts. I mean, it's... it's, it's, it's and he's, he's not, he's from, I think, Toronto. He lives in, and he just, because he was looking for the location. So, yeah, there were just so many factors that lined up. It was, that. that's why I, I do think there's a, a design element or choreography involved that it's beyond my personal wisdom or inner, inner knowing to to come up with something like that. so there are times when i imagine that i have a spirit guide and steve the guy the director he has a spirit guide and they kind of collaborate over it, and they're just laughing and laughing about how the two of us don't know how to sort it all out but we're you know we're going along with the project so that that's the main thing how, how the two of you don't what we 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 don't we're not consciously aware of how we came together but I'm sure it may be in the dream state in some in some some uh, theories, the dream state is where these higher aspects of ourselves plan out 
what's going to happen either tomorrow or in in the lifetime that is about to begin um you know there, there's the whole view that we there's survival after death and there's consciousness before birth and that there are certain life patterns that we um opt to live live through and that those are set at some at some <laughs> level we can be conscious of i'm i'm not personally conscious of but there are approaches to to do that well, I'm a, I'm a kind of bottom up kind of guy, rather than starting from the top, just yeah. like you described the embryo um, and following the template. I'm looking at it at the template that brought the two of you together. And the higher, I mean, uh, it's a good thing that you're able to talk with your higher consciousness sometimes, because there is a higher self in us that we communicate with. We don't know, and there's still more work to be done on that, but. There is a principle that uh, I first I first learned about from the poet Rumi that what you're looking for is looking for also looking for you. Hmm. What you're seeking is also seeking you. And that's a that's a fundamental principle among many uh, meaningful coincidences is that the two people come together because they need each other in some way. And your story with the with this guy in the movie is a, an excellent example of that. Now, that, let's just say that's a principle, just like uh, there's got to be heart muscle, so cells got to head to the right place to be heart muscle. Um, let's say that's a principle, that what you're seeking is seeking you. How does that fit in? possibly with biofield um, ideas? Well, I think it, in in some ways, he and I were both in the zone when that happened, that we were in a state of energetic alignment that allowed that seeking to, to, to find. And if we hadn't been, if, you know, whatever, our lives had taken slightly different courses, there still might have been that sense of trying to come together for some project or some higher purpose, but it wouldn't have clicked if, you know, if we weren't uh, totally lined up. So, I mean, that, that in the zone is a phrase that, that comes from sports, as you know, and it usually is used to describe athletes when they, when everything clicks and they have performances that are far beyond what they usually do. And it's a state of being that is much sought after, but, until recently had been thought to be something that just happens, you know, if you're lucky, it happens. And if not, well, I'll just keep hoping for the day when it does. Now, now there are approaches to, um, to getting into the zone um, by choice, not by chance. That's actually the title of a book by um, a tennis uh, coach named Scott Ford, who wanted to do that literally to make it by choice, not by chance. So, when those things happen, I think it's a it's a biofield that's part of the picture. There has to be some sort of higher purpose involved too, and that's where we get into the realm of spirit and soul. That, you know, what is my purpose being here in this lifetime? It has something to do with all this biofield stuff. Because as I wrote the book, I had a chance to you know look back on my life and why did this happen? Why did that happen? It seemed meaningless or irrelevant at the time, but now I can see how it fits together and I Rick did not consciously plan out first I'll do this then I'll do that then I'll do that but looking back on it now it, it is as if something shaped 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 it to to come to this and you know who knows <laughs> it, it, as I listen to you Rick um I see I once again hear the template shaping the embryo uh, the template that still has the bio has the amputated limb still activated. Uh, there's a that you are that your thinking is template, and that we are fit into the template somehow. Is, yeah, would that well, be? I think that's that's a that's a, a nice correlation. Actually, I hadn't thought of it in that way. But the whole thing about the power of intention is that you you hold a particular image of a event or a situation and come into alignment with it and all the, the negative stuff and the doubts you, you tend to release until you have a very clear image of it and then somehow or other life rearranges itself to fit your your image of it 
So that is a that is a template that starts at the level of a thought and I guess gets communicated to external reality through your biofield until <laughs> until it matches up. And so yeah, so that's actually that's great. That actually works. That deserves more discussion that the intention somehow programs the biofield that that's exactly what it is i think the intention programs the biofield and that's a skill and it takes some practice to get them to be working together because you know everybody's biofield we start off with all sorts of negative programming about what we can and can't do, whether we're worthy or not worthy, or, you know, what's the nature of reality, basically. And so once you do some of that work, and, you know, there are workshops all over the place now about how to build on the power of, the power of intention and uh, come into that alignment. But I think that's a good way of thinking about it. I like that. The intention aligns the biofield. Uh, could you give us a little description of what do you think that's, how thought influences the biofield? Yeah, I think that goes back to that sort of cascade model that I talked about. And, you know, I didn't develop it. Many different uh, metaphysical traditions have this notion of different levels that uh, from the from the most subtle down to the most uh, concrete. And the, the mental level is actually, there are thoughts that exist as thought forms, as energy patterns. And we can our consciousness can decide to focus on this one or that one. That's something you learn in meditation, how thoughts can come and go if you allow them to. You decide what you want to focus on. And by focusing on a thought of a particular image, it translates, transduces down through the field. So it starts with the thought. Then there are emotions that go along with it in, in ideal forms of power of intention. You, have, you summon up positive feelings of, appreciation and joy and, and and those things activate your energy system your biofield to be a more powerful radiating influencer and so when that kind of uh, energy is being put out there then the universe matches it up um, i don't quite get how that external world energy finds the corresponding energy within ourselves uh, but it, it, because it, you know we it, and it's different than magnets because in magnets uh, opposites attract and similars repel. But in this at this level at the spiritual level, um, similarities attract. Bird, <laughs> birds of a feather flock together at the spiritual level, if you will. And so we attract events that match our our beliefs and our biofields. So. I think that's. I think for me, it helps to to look at the different levels and how thought is one level that can start the process going. Well, you you just um, described uh, a bit of a gap in your visualization of the relationship between having a thought influencing the biofield and somehow having that thought in your biofield or shaping the biofield uh, with that thought, with its emotion, acts like a, the reverse of a, well, acts like a magnet with two poles that are both attracted, the negative and the positive attracting each other, but that's not quite right. But it's, it's more like uh, uh, a, a glove and a hand, they they fit together uh, somehow. So somehow you have this, you activate it in yourself, but what seems to still be um, vague in your thinking is how then the guy with the couch shows up um, with his need for somebody. He doesn't know it. You may not know it, but you both want it uh, somewhere in you. Both of, You like movies. He needs an advisor. Uh, there you are. Uh, and you don't know how that happens. I wonder if you just speculate a little bit about that particular instance and yeah. how it happened with biofuel yeah, thinking. That's, that's a good point. I think at some level, I guess I do believe that um, our higher selves, we use that phrase, had it planned out. Um, 
that in the dream state or wherever this happens. I mean, I, I used to read a lot of the, the Seth material, uh, some of the first channel stuff that came to uh, America in the 70s through, through a woman named Jane Roberts, talked about how we create our reality through our thoughts and beliefs. And a lot of it happens in the, the inner states of dream time, not just individual people setting up what they're, larger life plan is but also groups of people and even nations have collective consciousness at this inner level that works together in the dream state to coordinate how their really how their civilization is going to unfold and i think what happened with the couch was was more on a one-to-one -one type of basis um i you know there's no way of proving it or validating it. I I have some people that I've worked with over the years who are intuitives and psychics, and I trust their judgment. I could ask them what they saw, at what level did, did the connection come together? And that would be an, an interesting question. You know, it wouldn't convince a skeptic, but it would, it would help to address the question that you're as, asking about how does it actually come about? Yeah, it, it's. I hope you do, um, because it's a fundamental question. And I'm here on Earth, uh, and I'm trying to do ideas that might fit here uh, on Earth. And I, I think there's a a sense each of us has of being able to scan our environments, almost like radar. Uh, to be able to pick up elements in the environment that are coherent with our intention and coherent with our needs. So that that is a, a start in the direction of being able to say how the two of you come came together. There were these um, strange events, um, which <laughs> the strange events being like the the couch was a year late uh and yeah, it happened yeah. to be the right summer yeah um so yeah. those are those are hard to explain in the way i just said but not necessarily um because if we give ourselves the the ability to believe that we can scan our environments over time as well as space uh that we can maybe pick up information about where we need to be at what time we need to be. Uh, and Well, in, in general, I agree with that, but my wife and I wanted the couch now, <laughs> you know, we wanted it a year ago. And so that was all our focus was we, you know, we looked at other uh, warehouses and distributors and this particular one seemed to have the, the right couch. And it was just, we didn't know about the, we didn't consciously know about the, supply chain issues or the the incorrect ordering but it, it did work out that way well so. i i don't know how to explain the fairly common coincidence facilitator which is not getting what you want when you want it um like being late uh for something uh or you i happen fairly regularly with me that uh, a patient says I uh, can't show up, but it's a great time for me because I'm going to have difficulty being there myself. I've got another thing I, I'd rather do and reschedule became the, the idea that this becomes a fairly common event where you don't get what you want or you think you want. Um, but then because you got delayed, it turns out to be better. Yeah. And I, I think that's, kind of a inner wisdom piece that uh, our conscious mind wanted such and such to happen, but it was actually more to our higher advantage to have that fall apart and something else take its place. And um, I, I guess I do think that there is some part of us that had that in mind. It's just very di a different part of us than our conscious mind. And, and then um, I then I I agree with the idea that there's something else going on, uh, <laughs> and that that that's part of the fun of for synchronicity, for me is like, hey, 
what what's with this what's going on here and mm. my favorite is still it's like being in a video game and there's some teenager at a different dimension who's like yeah. playing with our free will potential and arranging things for us us to happen and whatever the case is rick um i i'd like to be able to ask you about the larger consciousnesses that you have mentioned that there are group consciousness that you and i know very well from sports uh where the fans really make a difference and the players know to get the fans to <laughs> hey can you give us some plat they know that they get energized by the fans yeah uh, and and that, that was, groups that was a really... sorry that was a really fun part about uh making that documentary about the the red sox baseball team is because we, we were allowed to go onto the field and interview the players. And, you know, I read about all this stuff, but they describe it as it's a very real, very tangible thing. And one, one guy said that fan energy is the ultimate amphetamine, which <laughs> I, I didn't mean that quite literally. But and another one said about how he, David Ortiz, actually, he's probably the best known Red Sox guy, about he could take it into his, he could feel the heart energy, the love from the fans, and he could take that in as a tangible thing that he could feel and other players talked about um you know basically what they could do in this altered state of consciousness when they're in the zone and it, it's basically psychic stuff it's parapsychology that that these baseball players were describing about knowing what the batter is looking for when he's pitching so he does the opposite or you know things like that um the, there's a, a really phenomenal, I think I have it here. The, the best book on that was written maybe 50 years ago by Michael Murphy, the guy who founded the Esalen Institute. It's called In the Zone. And this is this is the original issue, edition of it. It's Transcendent Experience in Sports. And it's basically athletes describing spiritual experiences while they're playing, where their consciousness is so expanded that they can see the future. They can see biofields. A bunch of them talk about seeing the biofield of their opponents and so it's it's a, a sport is a really good forum for exploring all this stuff um M murphy said uh sport is the yoga of the west and that's a really beautiful just summarizes the essence of it that sport is just as valid a uh, spiritual path as yoga or meditation or what have you that, that's so important uh, from my perspective to keep going, to get men more involved with it, uh, obviously, is a, a big value of it. And that's why I like to tell people that um, I tried out for the Pirates and uh, I was scouted by the Oakland Raiders because it, it says that I, I know what sports experiences are like. Uh, and I was particularly energized in big games. Um, mm -hmm. now it, it was a playoff game. I let batted first. It was Delaware was small, but uh, I batted first, the bottom of the first, and um, against the guy who played first base for the Phillies after uh, he left, uh, I, he was pitching, and I hit the first pitch for a home run over the center fielder's head. And my brother said I was rounding second base before the ball came down. Which I like. It's a nice story. I don't know if that was true. Uh, I don't hit home runs. I didn't. I, I won a batting title bunting, um, but uh, that was one of those. Be energized by the first game of the playoff and all the stuff that was happening around it and getting into the zone of seeing that pitch and going for it. I have other instances of that personally of being there and just knowing I can do it. Um, and but see, that, that's the thing. You were able to use that energy positively. Other people get spooked by it and they, they get the yips or something and they, they can't get it together the way you did. It, that's true. So that like Joe Montana, quarterback of great fame and others uh, got better during crunch time. I mean, that's when things were on the line. They got better. They, they got into that zone. Now that's sports, and we can talk about how the fans and David Ortiz will tell us about that. But you also mentioned groups and even nations, that there's group energy that can be intentionally created to make things happen. 
And I'm particularly interested now, and I'm writing a book now about the collective consciousness of humanity. I'm calling it the, I'm calling humanity the collective human organism. And I'm describing the, the mind of the collective human organism and trying to suggest that each of us is a cell in this collective human organism with a particular function and that we can create a field around us and with us that then can join with nature, with the biofield of Gaia and the mind of Gaia to somehow intentionally create a, a, a world that's different from the direction that we're going in. Wow, that's a that's a beautiful outline, a beautiful model for for how to how to think about it, how to proceed, and yeah, it 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 fits. It's congruent to what what I'm talking about as well, and um, you know, sp sp sports. You can certainly see it with the group energy in the team coming into coherence for their higher purpose. Um, in the in the 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 movie I did, the, uh, we we showed that these kind of energies. Um, are contagious and they can spread and and train or bring into harmony other people who aren't uh, part of it. Like I was, I was um, the guinea pig basically in a, a meditation experiment where I was wired up for to measure my heart rate variability, my heart coherence, but I was blindfolded and I had you know I couldn't hear anything. In the, this was at the Heart Math Institute in California and. At some point, unbeknownst to me, a group of four meditators came and sat behind me. And on a signal, they started doing this heart-centered meditation. There's no chanting or movement. They just feel a sense of appreciation in their heart. And the question was, what would it do to my heart rate variability? And, you know, I was my baseline was kind of sputtering along with not much happening. And literally within 10 seconds of them entering that state, mine started to go up and up and up and up and up. And it was really dramatic that I got entrained. I, it, Another, I guess I like analogies, is like a tuning fork. I was, my nervous system was like a tuning fork that began to resonate to them. So that was five people in a room. You can have 35,000 people in a stadium, or you can have a globe of a world of it. And, you know, um, the, the um, outgrowth of the Princeton engineering research um, has, there's a network of monitors now that are, detecting global changes in, in consciousness and in attention and intention. It's measurable. It's real. And, and there are certain events that uh, show up on, in this global monitoring system. Like, for example, um, one that I like to, to mention because it's, it's very cool is uh, every year there's a, on Valentine's Day, actually, is World Sound Healing Day that... Um, some sound healers from Colorado, Jonathan and Andy Goldman, have built up a lot of followers who on this given day, they have agreed to spend time chanting, singing, humming, making sound with the intention of helping to build the world peace, the world peace organization. And this global consciousness project, their monitors um, detect very high rates of coherence during that day, not the day before, not the day after, but during the day of um, of this meditation practice. So um, the, the graph is, uh, if, if the viewers want to go to the website, the, it's the um, the mysteryoflifeenergy.com, and there's a, a section on, um, the, the graph is shown in, in the section on um, highlights that you can just click on that. And, and it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's technical looking, but you can... There's no mistaking that something really dramatic happened then. And I think this is getting into your notion of the global mind, that when people, there, there are similar uh, studies with meditation, and there's a actually a well-known TM study where they had a transcendental meditation, where they had a, a, a conference, I guess you'd call it, in Washington, D.C., where Hundred several thousand people came together over the course of a week or two to meditate. That's all they did is they meditate together for the course of a couple of weeks, and the the impact they were looking at was what effect did that group meditation have on the crime rate in Washington D.C. And it sounds ridiculous, but as more and more people joined in the meditation, 
the crime rate went down, 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 it went down like 25% when it was at the um, peak attendance. And, you know, how, how can that be? What possible connection could there be between a bunch of people sitting in a room and focusing their mind in a certain way and what happens out there? And this is where you, you have to get into the, the notion of a non-local mind that people like Larry Dossey and others have talked about poetic sciences and investigated it, that there's some other level that we're just becoming aware of that, that you know, as you talk about, that there is some sort of collective human group mind at, at, at a global level, which is, it changes everything if you start to think in those terms that we're not just some little, you know, a box of muscles and bones and, and neurons, but that we're connected to where we are, we are each a neuron in a bigger brain, if you want to extend it that way, or a cell in a bigger organism. And we have different functions, and that part fits perfectly, and that we can work in alignment with the earth too. That That's something that I've gotten especially interested in more recently um I, I <laughs> excuse me i mentioned that my wife is Brit british so we've had a chance to go to england fairly often and at first it was the main interest was in places like stonehenge and avebury and it turns out that the ancients had some sense of an energy aspect to the earth itself and they built these um megaliths they're called the monuments at sites that had a particular alignment with the earth energy and there are there are maps that show how especially in southern england you can make a straight line connecting this church and this holy well and this stone circle all across, 200 miles long and it's it, so it, the picture looks exactly like an acupuncture meridian with acupuncture points of the earth and again that that uh, diagram is also one of the um highlights in, in on the website and it's just it's just very cool to see so we like that but then more recently over the last 20 30 years in those same areas they've started to have this uh natural phenomenon called in the wheat fields called crop circles in which the wheat stalks kind of lay down in clusters and patterns that from above or from a hilltop form very large, very complex, very elegant geometric patterns that honestly nobody has a clue of how they happen, but there's some sort of reflection of a, of a higher consciousness. And I don't know whether it's Gaia consciousness manifesting herself, whether it's human intention, whether it's extraterrestrials. I don't really know how it comes about or where it comes from, but it's it's fascinating because it's so it's it's my it's been my most tangible experience of something completely out of the ordinary. Actually, as I'm talking, I'm realizing right behind me is a calendar where each month has a different crop circle picture. And this was this is from it was last year, but you can get a little bit of a sense of it. And there's there's plenty of websites that that track it. And you know, there's like logarithmic spirals and fractal geometry and all these really, really complicated things that appear overnight. And they're like 200 feet across. So it's not something that some guys went out and bent each. <laughs> There's no way that people could do it. So that that for me is my currently most mind-boggling thing that I'm looking at. Well, if, there, if there's anything I take away from talking with you, Rick, it's the template idea that with the crop circles there's a template to make these complicated designs like little kids drawing in the something that's cut out and you, you, you kind of like fill in the space and you get a nice little weird thing happening because yeah. you're filling in the space that's already there with some that's empty with some color. And so there's a template that's a, a kid's thing like that, that gets filled in on the on the blackboard or the on the paper that's the wheat field uh yeah. you, so you're a template kind of guy uh from what i can tell because I, I what i do is look for the underlying organizing principles of other people's thinking that are potentially useful in what i'm trying to do with this collective human organism is just see like, like what position do you play on the team for example uh yeah, that's, a, that's a great comparison yeah yeah. Well, it's 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 still a it's still a sports thing, and 
I got my energy field has expanded talking with you. I could feel it uh, with the excitement of your imagination and the visions that you communicated to me, uh, especially because you understand uh, sports, uh, which a lot of the women I talk with don't, except there's one that plays with a great tennis player that I'm good friends with now who. I can do the analogies with, uh, so she, she, she gets it. She, she's, she was pretty good. And yeah. what you're reminding me of, uh, which I, I wouldn't want to take into too much consideration because it's kind of ego inflating, but it's also trying to be accurate. Um, that, uh, I, I was captain of the, of the football team, uh, in, college I'm one of the captains and captain of the baseball team in college captain of the ba baseball team in high school won the batting title my junior year in high school stuff like that um but we were the football team my senior year in high school was went nine or no we were undefeated and i i was the first i didn't start on the first team on the varsity until my senior year and the retired the the previous football coach um uh, was also watching us. He'd gone on to something else for our senior year. Uh, and he said that it wouldn't have happened without me, the getting nine or no, that I was the difference um, in that. And you're making me having to um, accept something that uh, has been hard to accept, is that my activity or energy field, or my bio field, my mind, and whatever this entity is that I am, can walk out onto a field, and you know, like when they elected a captain for the baseball team after, as I was graduating from college, one of the guys says, uh, yeah, we have uh, two captains now, because it takes two guys to replace you, and I, I just kind of like, uh, I did this kind of went away i didn't it, it was too what the, what are they making what are they talking about but that was another one of those indications that you're helping me having to absorb that i have an idea that, which i'm calling the psychotherapy for the collective human organism or i put together psychotherapy that i've written a couple of books about with this idea of the collective human organism and the stuff you're talking about, the biofield is right there with what I'm writing about. And that that and Gaia consciousness and the group minds, I'm just doing all that stuff right now. Some of the stuff you're talking about, but it's still more to understand. That that I may be in a position to do something um positive here. Uh and and writing this book has been really feeling good writing it. It's like running with the football in the open field. There's nothing more fun that I've done than running for a touchdown in the open field. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's very telling that you feel that energy when you're writing that way. I mean, I, I, I enjoy talking about this stuff and I can feel like I'm in the zone of talking. I'm not a particularly good athlete. I, mean, I could tell you my high school sports stories that the, the flip side of yours, but um. But no, I, I do, th <laughs> I do think there's there's something to be said for like you probably had a particular, call it charisma, that the that your your teammates resonated to and may may not have even been conscious, but somehow or other they amped up because of your presence. And it doesn't mean you're a better human being than them. It just meant you were in alignment for this particular task at this particular time, and they thrived as a result of it. And it's 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 a real thing it's a real thing it's a real thing well thank you for uh clarifying it and also putting it in its place because <laughs> that's important too i need that it's like what but anyway we've come to the end of uh, being able to talk uh today and uh i very much appreciate the, this biofield energetics um template um coincidence related discussion rick and uh uh, thank you very much for, for talking with me and informing me in the many ways that you have today. Well, you're welcome. And thanks again for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you. It's been really enjoyable. You're welcome. The psychosphere is our mental atmosphere Like a hologram 
Just me conscious now.